as we get ready for next weekend's message, Revelation 17 and 18. So make sure you're studying for this. But as we begin to prepare for the ending part of the book of Revelation, here's the disclaimer. I know some of you are walking into this particular sermon series for the very first time, and you're like, okay, great to be here, but we're going to study the book of Revelation. Yeah, welcome to the party, all right? So, but we would say that I, I, I didn't grow up in church, and many of us didn't grow up in church, and so we needed the preacher dude to kind of just break it down and make it simple, and that's the journey that we've been on. And so as you jump into today's message, know there's going to be a lot of background information that we have already covered. I won't have time to completely unpack all of it, but all of it's made available at the website called communitybible.com. All right, I'm going to pray. We'll jump into today's message. God, thank you for what you have in store for us today. Thank you for how you're moving so powerfully in our midst. Thank you, God, to be able to watch death to life stories through baptism is a miracle. May we never get tired of cheering for people, celebrating people. God, thank you for how you're moving in this congregation, not only here, but abroad. And pray that God, you'd use us to change the world. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. If you got a Bible, Revelation chapter 15, we're going to jump into this in just a few moments. But I want to share a message entitled, Just a Glimpse. Just a Glimpse. My wife and I were having a conversation a few days ago. In the midst of hardship, in the midst of struggle, in the midst of just going, God, are, are, are you going to turn it around? Are you going to work all things together for good to those who love you and called according to your purpose? God, could you just give me a glimpse? Is anybody else in the room relating and vibing with what I'm saying right now? That yes, you have faith, but sometimes you find yourself going, my faith is not big enough. And God, if you could just let me see, just give me a glimpse. You don't have to show me the whole story. You don't have to let me see the full picture. Just give me a glimpse. Whisper into my soul. Pull back the curtain. Give me just a corner of the frame, letting me know that you are working things for your good, my good, your glory, your fame, your renown. God, can you just show me? And we've been walking through some very heavy stuff, some dark stuff, to be quite forthright and transparent. And one of the things that I've loved about our Revelation study and Justin, our our dear brother that coordinates up there in the baptism that's just cheering everybody on. I mean, he's like a, he's like a hype man of all hype men up there in the baptistry. He said this, he said, my whole life, I've been afraid of the book of Revelation, hellfire and brimstone, of which it is. But to be able to study the book of Revelation and see hope, to see God's kindness and goodness has been not only revelatory, but also inspiring for all of us. And I just want us to get a glimpse once more of what God wants us to hear today. And here's the target statement. In the darkest of days, there's a light that, what's up, bro? There's Justin right there, the, the human highlight film right there. I mean, that's what I'm saying. In the darkest of days, there's a light that shines brighter, but sometimes it has to be discovered due to the distractions that seek to cloud it. Sometimes we have to see the unseen, hear what's not been heard. God, in the darkest of days, in my strife, my struggle, my scenario that seems as if it's against me, God, I know you're there. God, help me have faith big enough that you are moving, you're maneuvering, you're orchestrating, strategizing. God, help me to believe that you're there, that somehow you're going to make a way. Just give me a glimpse of your goodness that will give me encouragement to have tenacity, grit, fortitude, that I won't give up today. I won't give in today. I'll wake up tomorrow and fight another day. And so as we get to Revelation chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says this, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great And amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. It's the word telestai. It's the same word that Jesus would say on the cross, telestai, it is finished. Now, for those of you that are just jumping into the series, there are three sets of tribulation. Now, there's seven years of tribulation, but there are three waves of tribulation in the seven years. It begins with seven seals. It's where we see the four horsemen of the apocalypse. There's seven trumpets that talk about one-third of the earth, one-third of the sea, one-third of the river. And so you begin to see God bringing judgment to the earth, but only in ratios and fractions. But now we get to the seventh descriptor towards this plague and the bowls that are poured out. And this is the moment where it goes from bad to worse. This is the moment where grace has run out. This is where mercy has run out. You go, Ed, I thought God was benevolent. I thought God was kind. I thought God was patient and long-suffering. Absolutely. 
As we talk about the seven years of tribulation, and this is what we've been studying. We're seeing the first three and a half years of the seven seals and the seven trumpets, and God has used the 144,000 Jewish evangelists to preach Jesus. God has used the two witnesses to preach Jesus. God has used the angel from heaven to preach Jesus. In the seven years of tribulation, God has always been making a way for people that would turn from Satan and follow Jesus. But what we're studying today is that time has run out. Hearts are hardened. Eyes have been blinded. There will be no more people that are being saved. This is just a glimpse of about the future of what we're studying in the book of Revelation. But as we get to Revelation chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, it begins to talk about these judgments, but this is the final judgment. These final judgments known as the bowls or the plagues. Now, verse 2 says this in Revelation 15. It says, I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. And also those who have conquered the beast, that is Satan, and its image, which is the Antichrist, and the number of its name, which is the demonic forces of hell, standing beside the sea with glass, with with a harp of God in their hands, and they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. There are two songs being sung, the song of, the Mo- of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Now, as we look to point number one, we see the vision of heaven. It's a glimpse It's not the full ramification of which we will talk about when we start getting into Revelation 19, 20, 21, and 22, which is why I want to pump the brakes, pull the emergency brake up, look at a couple more chapters, and then we're going to slow our roll and begin to look at Revelation 19, 20, 21, and 22 as it talks about heaven. And I don't want to rush through those verses because we've been talking about some scary stuff. But I want you to know what's coming for us. I want you to know about the kingdom that we're going to rule and reign within with God on the throne. And so we're going to begin to look at that, but we got some more scary stuff stuff that we got to walk through, but we should not be afraid. Here's the reason why. Because as we get a vision of heaven, there's also letter A, an appearance of purity, an appearance of purity. These tribulation saints, let me define this, people that give their life to Jesus in the seven years of tribulation. There are many people that would believe that the church goes through the tribulation. I humbly hold to a view that there's a rapture that the church as we know it, not just CBC, but the capital C church, does not go through the seven years of tribulation. But I also believe that there will be a church still in the seven years of tribulation, which is the Jesus followers that don't take the mark of the beast, don't worship Satan, give their life to Jesus Christ. They will face persecution and trial and tribulation unlike any human being has ever faced as a follower of Jesus on this planet. They will eventually go, Revelation 20 would say this, to the guillotine where they'll have their heads chopped off for the sake of the glory of Jesus. Which, by the way, is so encouraging to me today. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Because they would rather die for the sake of the gospel than to take the mark of the beast and eat the food that he provides, to eat the, or drink the water that he provides. They would rather die for the sake of the gospel, which, by the way, is encouraging to me from the standpoint of, Ed, would you wake up every day and live for the glory of Jesus and not for the fame of this world? Would you choose to be conformed to Jesus versus the philosophy and the world view of this present day? And what's encouraging to me about this, even though it's so gory of how they die, is the fact they would not sell out. Come on, somebody. They wouldn't sell out. They would not cave in to the pressures of this world. They would choose to be the true essence of what the church actually means, which is a word called ecclesia, called out one. See, God didn't call you to blend in. God called you to stand out. And I'll make this statement, and sometimes it will be costly. It'll be costly. And I'm not saying we'll die for our faith, but may we be reminded that there are brothers and sisters all across the globe right now that are dying for their faith. And we are in arms with our brothers and sisters. May we never take for granted the fact that we could come into a gathering much like this and worship the name of Jesus in freedom. May we never take this for granted. That we have the opportunity to open up God's word and say, thus saith the Lord, because if we're not careful, don't miss this. What I'm preaching today can eventually be deemed as hate language. It'll be costly. And we got to make a decision. 
of how we'll stand, how we'll live, will we buckle and bend. And the tribulation saints that we're talking about today, even though they would die, here's what's so encouraging to me about this. They didn't lose. They're standing on the sea of glass. Revelation 4, 6 would say that the throne of God would have a platform that looked like crystal. When we talk about a sea of glass, let me just nerd out for just a second. Y'all still listening? Come on, say amen. Amen. For those of you watching online, light up the chat bar right now. Here's the reason why. Outside the temple, there was what's known as a laver. That's a fancy way of saying a bowl. Every time a priest would go into the temple, he would have to wash his hands. He'd have to purify himself. So the image that's seen here of the tribulation saints standing by a sea of glass, many would say it's because they've been purified by the goodness of God. How? Because there's fire attached to this sea of glass through the fiery trial and tribulation of persecution from Satan and the Antichrist. But they come out on the other side. So the appearance of purity is so captivating to me. Why? Because it leads to letter B. Write this down because it affirms or it's the affirmation of peace. You go, peace. Check this out. Verse 2 says they conquered Satan. They conquered the Antichrist. Can I remind somebody today? You're more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. That word conquer is where we get the word nikeo. Sounds familiar, does it not? If you're rocking Nikes, that's a Greek word for victory or to conquer. When we hear the phrase that we are more than conquerors, it means actually that we are hyper nikeo, which means we are super conquerors. And listen, I know you're awesome, but God is awesomer. And the one who's made us his sons and daughters says, listen, in and of ourselves, we are weak, frail people. But when Jesus Christ begins to become our Lord and Savior, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And therefore, we do not fear darkness. We do not fear the demons. We do not fear the Antichrist. We don't fear the false prophet. We don't fear Satan. Satan has no authority over me. He has no authority over you. And when you and I see this moment... All of a sudden, this affirmation of peace, they are standing on the sea of glass because they've come through the fire. The tribulation saints, those that were killed for the sake of the gospel said, listen, they thought they killed us. They thought we were done, but they failed to recognize that because Jesus Christ is the ultimate warrior, because Jesus Christ is the heavyweight champion, because he defeated sin, death, and hell and came back from the dead, Satan thought he won when he led us to the guillotine. However, what he did not understand is that our soul is in heaven and one day our body will be reunited with our soul. Here's the reason why, because death ain't no period with Jesus, it's a comma. Because when you and I give our life to Jesus Christ, death has lost its sting. Death has no victory, which means I should not fear death. Now, listen, I ain't trying to die today. I got a lot to live for today. But if I die on this stage, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, is true. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Just drag me off and somebody keep preaching Jesus, but somebody start rocking my J's, all right? Somebody take my J's and wear them for the glory of the Father. But hear me. They're singing, they're singing an anthem of praise. It's letter C, write this down, it's an anthem of praise. What are they singing? The song of Moses. Do you know that heaven sings a song that earth teaches it? It's the song of Moses. What was the song of Moses? It's Exodus 15, verses 1 through 3. The Lord is my strength and my song has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God, I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. You say, Ed, what's the context? Our boy Moses, all of a sudden, he's backed up against the water. He's been called and commissioned to lead two million people across the Red Sea. Daunting task, to say the least. All of a sudden, there's a dust cloud of chariots moving in the direction of the nation of Israel. Pharaoh leading the way. But all of a sudden, Moses, a man of faith, steps out into the Red Sea. Oh, could we have some more faith-filled people, myself included. Walks into the Red Sea, slams his staff down, and the water begins to divide. And the Bible says that the nation of Israel did not cross on muddy ground, but on dry ground. You know why? Because the promises of God underneath you are always firm. Are always firm. And as the nation of Israel began to traverse and transgress across the dry land to the other side, all of a sudden the water comes in over Pharaoh and all of the Egyptians. And they, in that moment of victory, began to sing what's recorded in Exodus chapter 15, verses 1. The Lord is my strength. 
The Lord is my song. The Lord is my salvation. I underline the word my. You know why? Because it needs to be your song. Can I ask you a question today? You don't have to answer out loud. You don't have to raise your hand. Is he your song? Is he your strength? Is he your salvation? If not, today's the day that Jesus wants to step out of heaven and step into your heart to change you from the inside out. But they not only sang the song of Moses, but they sang the song of the Lamb. What's the song of the Lamb? We learn about this in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, you can hear this mentioned in verse 12. It says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, wealth, and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing, honor, glory, might forever and ever. Who's the Lamb? It's Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So they sing two songs, the tribulation saints do, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. But both of those songs speak of deliverance. Both of those songs speak of the fact that Satan and the enemy has been defeated and that you and I walk in victory. Now listen. I used to play basketball in high school and college. I still feel like at 46, I'm still an athlete. I feel like I still can go a little bit today. But can I say this to you? When I was playing basketball in high school and in college, what would happen in our fan base when an away team came to our school, this didn't happen a whole lot in high school because we lost a lot, but we were pretty successful (laughs) in college. But our fan base would begin to say statements like this as we began to get to the final quarter. The score was obviously lopsided. Home team's about to win. I'm on the home team. And all of a sudden, the fan base at that particular moment began to say phrases like this, start the bus. They chant it, start the bus, start the bus. You're like, what were they saying? Hey, listen, the same school bus that you rode on to come here, bus driver needs to go on. The game's not even over yet, but there's no way you're coming back. There's no way that you're going to gain the victory. You've been defeated. They might as well go warm the bus up because when that, that horn sounds, you might as well get back on it and go home where you came from with a big capital L. <laughs> then there were moments that would shake their keys. A little bit confident, I understand. But then there were moments in crowd bases, they begin to sing songs like this, na, 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 na. Na, 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 hey, 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 goodbye. Can I tell you what the saints in heaven are doing? They're shaking keys, but it ain't their keys. It's the key of Jesus that defeated sin, death, and hell. He's got all victory. What's the song of heaven? Na, 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 hey, 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 goodbye. Who are they singing to? Satan. Can I just say this? Some of us need to begin to dis- implement this tradition. When it starts getting rough in your house and the enemy tries to discourage you and defeat you, can you just start shaking some keys? Just start shaking some keys. When all hell breaks loose in your life and you understand the moment you chose to live for God, you, you knew it was going to get hard. Oh, may we not blame God for the fact that it got hard in our life. May you recognize that hell has put you on the radar. Don't take that as a criticism. Take it as a compliment that you are a threat to hell. That the demons, they're not scared of us, but they're afraid of Jesus, the power of Jesus in us. And as we walk as sons and daughters, this anthem of praise, it's our song of victory. Because Jesus has given us victory. Letter D, write this down. Not only do we see... The appearance of purity, the affirmation of peace, the anthem of praise. But you also see the arrival of the promise. Now the scene shifts. Once more, this is a glimpse of what's taking place. Verse 5, after this, I looked in the sanctuary of the tent of witness, or the tabernacle of witness. In heaven was opened, and out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chest. This isn't like homecoming court, prom court. These seven angels with the sashes are as a statement of royalty and nobility. They are messengers on behalf of God. But notice verse 7. They're given something by one of the four living creatures. When we talk about angels, there are angels, there are cherubim, and there's seraphim. And as we talk about the seraphim, the four living creatures, we've mentioned this already. They deliver something to the seven angels. And as they deliver this, it is bowls full of the wrath of God. Everything up to this point has been one-fourth, one-third. Now the percentages and the fractions are thrown out the window. It is all of God's wrath poured out on Satan, the false prophet, the antichrist, the demons, and all those who have taken the mark of the beast and said, we want nothing to do with you, God, and they're enemies of God. Wrath is coming. 
And the sanctuary begins to fill up with smoke in verse 8, which is always a statement of judgment, bringing about the finishing of these three significant scenes of vindication. The seals, trumpets, bowls, or plagues. Now, as we work through this, understand this arrival of the promise. It comes from the temple or the tabernacle of witness. Let me just geek out for a second. What is the tabernacle of the testimony? This is the holy of holies. Now, I needed the preacher dude to make sense of this for me. One day a year, as you read the Old Testament, it's called the Day of Atonement, Yom Yom Kippur. The priest would go into the Holy of Holies. The veil separated him from the Holy of Holies. He would take the blood from the sacrifice. He would bring it into the Holy of Holies, and he would apply the blood onto the Ark of the Covenant. Four by two by two box. And I'm not talking about Raiders of the Lost Ark. Four by two by two box that signified the testimony or covenant of God's promise. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? Three things. Ten Commandments, manna or Chick-fil-A, however you want to interpret that. (laughs) And then a dead stick called Aaron's rod that had a blooming flower at the end. I believe all three of those things point to Jesus as the promise keeper. He's the yes and the amen. He's the only one that could keep the Ten Commandments in purity and wholeness. He is the bread of life, the manna, and he's also the one from death comes life, which is a dead stick with a blooming flower at the end of it. I believe all of it points to Jesus, which is why the priest would go into the Holy of Holies, apply the blood of the lamb to what's known as the mercy seat. That's the top of the box. There are two cherubim, angels, that are protecting the holiness of God. He applies blood to the mercy seat. Why? Because we need forgiveness. And every day he brought, or every year he brought blood onto the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, to intercede on behalf of us. Now let me just sidebar this. When Jesus Christ went to the cross and died as our high priest, the moment he breathed the last, his last, the veil was torn from top to bottom as to say we don't need any more earthly mediators allowing us to come into the Holy of Holies. Hebrews 4, verse 15 and 16 says that we could come before God with boldness and confidence. Why? Because Jesus is our high priest. He's the one that died for us once and for all. Now, watch this. And for those who say thanks but no thanks to Jesus, who drank all of the wrath of God, I'll say that again. He died on the cross for our sin, past, present, and future. And when he would say, tell us, die, it is done, it is finished, it's because he drank every drop of the wrath of God for your sin, my sin, past, present, and future, and drank every drop of it. It's why he would say, may this cup pass from me in the Garden of Gethsemane, but then he would later say, but not my will, but thine be done. The moment that you or me, or anyone else says thanks but no thanks to Jesus towards salvation. He doesn't drink the cup of the wrath of God. You will. And that's judgment. I know that's unpopular. I know in today's conversation of cultural relevance, I know in a day and age of intolerance or tolerance, I know that this is a very divisive message, but I love you enough in this room to preach a whole gospel, not a half gospel, but a whole gospel that you would understand that yes, God is good and heaven is real, but at the same time for anybody that says no to that judgment, eternal separation. And when God sends his angel, the seraphim, from the holy of holies, it's because it's a statement as the room begins to fill up with smoke that judgment is coming to the earth on those that don't want Jesus as their Savior. I mentioned this last weekend, for those of you that are new, watching online as well, we talked about the grain harvest and the grape harvest, that Jesus has the sickle. You go ahead, I don't know what a sickle is. It's a staff with a razor blade at the bottom of it. You see the grim reaper holding that. But as we talk about Jesus holding this, it's bringing judgment. The grain harvest that I talked about last weekend is the moment where Jesus comes and he cuts the supply chain to those that have no regard for God, that have been enjoying the general grace of God. You go, Ed, what do you mean by general grace? I'm talking about air, oxygen, water, food, 
supplies. God goes, I've tried to warn you through the seven seals judgment, through the seven trumpet judgments, and now as the plagues of the earth are about to come, I am cutting off, I'm taking the sickle, and I am removing the vine of the earth from meeting your needs. You will not shake your fist at me and blaspheme me while drinking my water. You will not shake your fist at me and eat my food. You will not shake your fist at me and breathe my air. God takes away general grace. For the person that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, they're enjoying the general grace of God. We enjoy the specific grace of God that my sins have been forgiven. My life was on my way to hell, but Jesus redirected my life, rerouting, 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 all the way to heaven. And as we think about this, general grace now being removed and all of these seven plagues are coming after the inhabitants of the earth and the earth itself. And it now leads to this judgment being decreed and delivered. And the Bible would say this in verse 7 and 8, that it was deserving, deserving. Now we jump into Revelation chapter 16, verse 1, gives us point number 2. Not only do we see the vision of heaven, we now see the vengeance from heaven. Verse 1, then I heard a loud voice from the temple calling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls. This is the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful, painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its name. The vengeance from heaven, letter A, we're noticing now the description of these bowls, these seven judgments, seven specific judgments, many of which will coincide or correlate or parallel some of the previous judgments that we've talked about. But as we talk about the description of the bowls, we talk about the spread of sores. Verse 2, these sores, original language, would reveal ulcers, boils, breaking out all over people's bodies, not just in a general area, holistically in pain, anguish. But as they're writhing in pain, The second bowl is unleashed, and it is the subjection of the sea. Notice in verse number three, and the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was in the sea. Now, do you remember this from the second trumpet? Do you remember what we talked about? There was a meteor that came to the ocean, creating tsunamis, unexplainable, but also one-third of the water began to experience death. A statement of God still making a way for people to turn their hearts back to him. Grace has run out. This third set of judgments dealing with the third plague correlates with the sea. However, you see something different. It's not one-third of the sea that experiences death. All of the sea. 70% of the earth that we live on is water. You talk about a supply chain issue. All of the ocean, death, everything in it now floating to the top. Death and disease running rampant. While still dealing with the boils or the ulcers or the sores, now seeing the water turn completely to death. There's another element that deals with the streams of water. There's a strike on the streams. You'll see this in verse 4, third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, Just are you, holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of saints and the prophets, talking about tribulation saints, and you've given them blood to drink. It's what they deserve. Did you hear that? It's what they deserve. What goes around comes around. It's what God's saying. And as we think about the streams, the springs, the oasis, the aquifers, the rivers, as people are writhing in pain, supply chains have been cut off, which means that maybe even medicinal supplies are not able to be delivered. There are people that just want a drink of water and can't find it. Do you remember as we talked about the star known as wormwood that goes into the streams? The word wormwood in Russian is where we get the word Chernobyl. It means toxic. Every water source, inland, lakes, rivers, aquifers, streams, poison. Not just the third of it, all of it. 
And now we go into the fourth dynamic of the plague of the bowls, known as the scorching of the sun. You'll see this mentioned in verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire, solar flares. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and you would think they would turn towards God, but instead they cursed the name of God who had the power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. A fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. You go ahead, where is the throne of the Antichrist? This is what this is speaking of. When you begin to see the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, the Dome of the Rock, the Golden Dome, if this is the location, then Satan, through demonic powers, has allowed the Antichrist, anti-Jesus, to set himself up in the temple receiving worship. So as the sun has been scorching people, no no SPF strong enough to protect you. No shades broad enough to shelter under. Now the sun goes dark, much like mimicking the plagues of Egypt, but it's specifically over the temple where Satan has empowered the Antichrist to be in the temple to receive worship. As to say, judgment is coming for Satan, Antichrist, the false prophet, and the demonic forces of hell. And then it goes on to say that the sources in verse 12 of water is severed or dried up. Listen to verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. You go, Ed, what's the significance of the Euphrates River? Many would say that the oasis or the beginning point, the headwaters of the Euphrates River is where the Garden of Eden is. So what is God saying? I'm cutting off all of my source of sustenance. All of my source of provision is cut off. But I need you to lean in. Y'all still listening today? Come on, say amen. As we talk about the Euphrates River, it actually served as a geographical boundary line, but also a barrier of protection for everything on the other side of the Euphrates River. The Bible says that the kings of the east will come across the Euphrates River into what's known as the Battle of Armageddon. It's called the Valley of Megiddo. If we ever have the opportunity to go to Israel together, we'll fly into Tel Aviv. You'll see the Valley of Megiddo. This is the battleground of where this will take place. The Euphrates River serves as a natural geographical barrier to the kings of the east. But God goes, I'm drying up the Euphrates River. Come on, listen to me. You know why? Because God goes, I want you to step into the octagon. I want you to step into the ring where I will take you out. He creates an HOV lane right into the battlefield. No red lights. Come on in. No toll plazas. Walk all in. And all of a sudden, Satan, beginning to use demonic forces... Persuading. We'll speak to that in just a few moments. But I want to give you the seventh bowl. The seventh bowl is mentioned in verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. Why? Because the cosmic battle that Satan leads, he's the prince of the power of the air. And a loud voice came out from the temple, from the throne, saying, It is done. Tell us, die. It is finished. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunders, great earthquakes such that have never been since man was on the earth. So great was the earthquake that the great city, it's Jerusalem, split into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell and God remembered Babylon. Babylon is not a city, it's a world philosophy that stands against God. To make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And here's an interesting verse, notice this. Every island fled away, no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, about 100 pounds, fell from heaven to the people. And you think that they would turn from their wicked ways and trust God. But that's not the case. Time has run out. They've cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. As we talk about this seventh bowl, there's an interesting phenomenon here that many commentators would allude to and speak to. That these earthquakes were so seismic and tectonic plates shifting that something actually interesting begins to transpire. That the earthquakes that would take place brought every mountain low and every valley high. Every island began to disappear. You've heard of what's called Pangea. At one particular point before a global flood, in my humble opinion, all of the continents were one, one landmass. But as that began to drift into continents and separation, 
There's a God that's uniting through earthquakes all of the landmass together, bringing all his enemies to him for a moment of final vindication and judgment. But watch how God is always able to turn something bad into something good. Are you picking up what I'm laying down? Because there's coming a kingdom Well, he will reign and we will be with him. And God wants us to be so close to him. He doesn't want us separated on continents. That God would bring it all together where we can have the same zip code, the same area code. That we can be living together, walking in the presence of the fullness of God. So God, through this great earthquake, brings all landmass together. But in the midst of all of this, we'll see the deceitfulness of the beasts. Satan. The Antichrist, the false prophet. Let's jump back up to verse 13. It says, I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, that's Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, that's the Antichrist, out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. Frogs are always synonymous with pollution or poison. It goes on to say, for they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world. Now, for those of you that are just jumping in, this is going to sound so crazy. But we've already talked about the seven-headed monster with ten horns, seven previous nations, and the ten horns are a reference to a one world alliance, one world government, one world currency. The question I've been asked in recent days, Ed, is America a part of the revelation story? Where is America? America is gone. It is absorbed like every other country into an assimilated one world government led by Satan. But I stand in front of you today and go with the time that we got left and the time remaining while every hair on my arm stands up when we sing a national anthem. And I'm grateful for the country that we live in, for the men and women that have defended the freedom that we get to operate in democracy. Our country... The worn, torn, and tattered, and a lot of moments in our American history that we are not proud of. And I wish we could go back in a race and do it all over again. But when we talk about our foundation of a nation under God, asking God to bless America again, could we understand that could it be that the salt and the light of the world, Jesus' followers, are on mission with a cause and a purpose to not waste our life but to use the very democracy and the freedoms that we've been given, not just to do our own thing, but to live such an evangelistic life that people would see the Jesus in us because there is a day of judgment coming. I'm grateful for our nation, but all nations during the tribulation period will concede and defer to a satanic entity. Why? Because there will be signs and miracles. And I just want to speak this over your life because this is the same tactic of the enemy It'll be so easy to listen to this person that's able to do the miraculous and operate in the supernatural that all of the nations of the world will concede. Anybody that could give economic hope, anybody that could give medicinal hope, anybody that could speak to political alliances, this person will only be empowered by hell because it will be for his own purpose, his own reason, not to bring about unity, but to bring about division, hate, death, murder, leading people to an eternal separation in hell away from God and forgiveness and grace and mercy. And when we look at this, understand with persuasive speech, the enemy operates. Listen to me. The enemy communicates to you in pervasive, persuasive lies. They're all honey-dipped. The enemy cannot steal your soul, but the enemy seeks to make you incapable of living the the spirit-filled life and the destiny that God's called you to. The moment you choose to do your own thing, walking away from the word, the will, and the way of God, he can't steal your soul, but he will make you ineffective for the kingdom of God on this earth. He can't steal your soul from going to heaven, but if he could silence you, if he could cause you to blend in versus stand out, and I'm not just talking to adults in the room, I'm talking to some teens teenagers that would live a life counterintuitive of how the world is living, that you would choose to stand out, not blend in, that you would change the atmosphere and places and spaces that you walk into because of the light of the world that's in you. 
But the enemy, Satan, uses persuasive speech and uses performing signs of the wonders. There'll be many false prophets that'll walk amongst us. But a whole gospel, a death, burial, and resurrection, a real heaven and a real hell, that the true goal of living for Jesus is not what this stuff of the world has to offer us, but Jesus is my supply. Jesus is my strength. Jesus is my shield. Jesus is my song. You can take the whole world from me and I lose nothing. But if I walk away from Jesus and gain the whole world, then I'll forfeit my soul. And as we walk upon this earth, we see Satan leading in this same initiative, trying to distract and discourage and defeat. But if we can just get a glimpse, just a glimpse of what heaven is about and the reward that comes, then maybe we could stop living in defeat today. Here's the verse I'd love to leave you with today that gives us letter C, the deliverance in the battle. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on. Can I use improper English? If you, if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. I'll say it again. If you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. Blessed is the one who stays awake. Wake up, church. Jesus is coming. The first time he came, he came riding on a donkey. The second time he comes, he'll come riding on a white horse, faithful and true, with a sword from his mouth, a man of war, making vindication, true and right, righting all the wrongs, justice will prevail. But as he is mentioned here, the Bible says those who are not ready go about naked and exposed. You know what that's saying to you? Your religion can't cover you. Your church membership can't cover you. Baptism, as amazing as this is, doesn't save you. It can't cover you. Doing good things for Jesus can't cover you. You have to be in a real living relationship with Jesus. And I can't force that upon you, nor will I try to somehow intimidate you to make a decision. you got to be willing to say yes to Jesus. There's got to be a time where you go, I'm tired of doing it my way. I submit and surrender, and I'm going to let you take the keys, and I'm going to let you lead and guide and direct. It's all about you and my life. And I submit because I I know I'm not good enough to get to heaven on my own. Let me just close with this. Because if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Is a, pr- a picture that many of us have sta- sa- said so many times in our own mind. That if I just stay ready, I don't have to get ready. Because one day when Jesus comes and the trumpet shall sound, there will not be second chances. Let me see if I can use this illustration. Have you ever been around a couple that's expecting a baby? Especially as she goes further along in carrying that child. She begins to feel contractions. It's the sign and the symbol that one day she's about to give birth. And as they prepare for this, they get what I call a go bag ready. Do you know what I mean by a go bag? It's got everything that's needed for that hospital stay in the bag. Because when that water breaks, there'll be this type of conversation. She will look at him and go, this is all your fault. And he'll go, I know. Can we talk about this later? And there will not be a moment to get all the supplies in the bag because she's going, I'm ready. The baby's coming. You won't have time to pack. So you keep a go bag because when it's time, and you go. I want to give that illustration. Here's the reason why. Because I believe the birth pains, the contractions, of this world is taking place, helping us understand the necessity and the urgency to get a go bag ready. Because when he comes, when he comes, you won't have time to get your house in order. You won't have time to get your life straight. It's right here, right now. I don't know when death comes for any of us. I don't know when Christ comes, but I wanna wake up every day and I wanna be ready. Go bag ready. So with heads bowed, amen. Eyes closed for just a brief moment. Heads bowed, eyes closed. We're standing on the promises of God today. When he said it is finished, it is done, that we can have salvation. If you've not put your faith and trust in Jesus, today is the day. Call on his name. Say yes to him. We're going to pray this prayer out loud. This prayer is not some magical formula. It's a confession of salvation. 
If you want to receive Jesus, you're like, I, I am ready to do that today. Would you just pray this prayer? It's about the attitude of your heart, repenting of sin, trusting in Christ, giving him your life, not just missing hell. It's not fire insurance. It's giving your life to Jesus, choosing to follow him. Do what he tells you to do. If you want to receive Jesus today, say this to him, Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect, but I believe in you. Save me. Change me. I give you my life. If you prayed that prayer in faith today and you're watching online, text in the number that's on the screen. Our online team is going to celebrate with you. But if you made that decision in this room, hold your hand up as tall as you can. Don't put it down until I see you. If you gave your life to Jesus today, come on, raise that hand. Hold it up real tall. Somebody ought to be hugging some people right now. Somebody ought to be high-fiving some folks right now. We got some new brothers and sisters in the house of God today.